we only want to do this against an int. You can, you can specify, and then that will only be an integer. Uh, I only want this to be generic. Uh, particularly if you're working with an API or something, exposing that to, to some of the other .NET languages, that's very useful. Um, type inference. Life is a little bit different if you're used to writing C Sharp or OO versus uh, F Sharp. You've got this concept of overloading in C Sharp um, and sort of, you can see the terseness of the F Sharp code versus what you're writing in C Sharp even with this small sample. Uh, there's a little bit more decoration, a little bit more ceremony in C Sharp. And you see over here with uh, F Sharp, if I try to declare add for ints and an overload for decimals, a little bit of an adjustment period. So we're gonna have add int, we're gonna have add decimal if we need to quote unquote overload. Um, currying, uh, in, in functional int's name for Haskell curry, not named after the Indian food dish. Um, you take a function that has multiple arguments and actually uh, every function only has one argument and it's just a chain of successive functions with one argument each. So we can create add 42 by taking add, providing one number, and then taking in an additional parameter, uh, which lets you build really interesting cases where, okay, I know one of these parameters at this point, so I'll let new function equal partially applied function, we'll wait for that other parameter when we can get it. Uh, pattern matching or switch statements on steroids. Um, there are a number of things that you can do with that. We can sort of do very similar to a switch. If the state's uh, Alabama, if the state is Georgia, then here, Missouri tax rate's this. And then any other state, we really don't care about them. We'll just return a catch-all, uh, kind of a wild card here. Active pattern matching uh, is sort of where some of the steroids come in we can do dynamic detection and parsing of our data. So if I wanna do a regex map match on a string, for instance, and look for um, something that matches a zip code, then when I go to my pattern matching with this active pattern, match this with a zip code, and depending on whether this condition is satisfied, I parse that out and I get just that value which we can see later or you know, we don't have anything. There's a concept of record types and discriminated unions, which again, if you're going to be um, interoperating with C-sharp, maybe you wanna plug your F-sharp solutions uh, and F-sharp library into something that you already have, um, some web forms or MVC that you're doing in C-sharp or VBnet. Does anyone still do VBnet? Okay. Um, you create records this way which if you imagine in your favorite object-oriented language, um, do your getters and setters, declare this, um, or for discriminated union. This is the same thing that, um, you have these two in one file, you would break these over maybe multiple files in C-sharp just because this is much less verbose, much less ceremony, you can sort of get right to what you're thinking. Um, there's no nulls in functional except where there are. Um, option type is vastly preferable to null. You say you have some string or some number or you have none. Um, this lets you handle things a little bit more gracefully than the ever-present null, null reference exception uh, who hasn't ever seen one of those developing object-oriented. In order to play nicely with .NET, again, functional first, but we can instantiate a nullable and pass to a library or expose this in an API uh, if we have to let C Sharp or another language call into our F Sharp. Type providers. This is actually what got me most excited about F Sharp and most wanting to try it um, when, when I started. You can with two lines of code in some cases essentially, reference a data store or some type of web service, a CSV, uh, object, uh, relational database management system, and get basic types, you can get IntelliSense, and you can work with those objects um, 
as though it were an ORM. I think, I think of entity framework, if you generate uh, mapping between your code and your database, you can work with that dynamically at compile time. And it's not a replacement for an ORM. There are some features that you don't get. But if you look over here at this screenshot from a blog post from uh, 2014 from the Visual Studio uh, F Sharp team blog, typos and all that have not been corrected in two years, there are rough benchmarks of direct ADO.NET calls to the database, your handwriting your SQL, 57 milliseconds, uh, F Sharp type provider, right there with the dapper micro ORM, uh, eight milliseconds more overhead to get this IntelliSense, to get this ability to uh, sort of discover your, your values on the fly, and then link to SQL, link to SQL. Entry framework, I think they meant entity framework, um, that shoots up pretty dramatically. So there are a lot of things available when you install uh, Visual Studio, when you have the F Sharp libraries. Um, a lot of others are being developed even now, a lot of them are open source. If you have something that you need to interoperate with that doesn't exist as a type provider, uh, for instance, MATLAB didn't al always exist. Someone went out and built that. And you can go look at the source for those and figure out not only uh, what they did to build a type provider, but what good idiomatic F Sharp looks like uh, because there's so much source and the source for language is out there. Um, I'll look at the dev environment real briefly. Another great thing about F Sharp, uh, which didn't call out earlier, is that you've got this F Sharp interactive uh, REPL, uh, read, evaluate, print loop, and, well, that didn't really help up down here. Uh, so I can just start typing. I can say let add x, x y equals x y and that will tell me uh, for everything that I've done in that session when I do the, the uh, double semicolon okay I declared this function which is a, a first class object which I can pass as an argument to other functions uh, I declared this add and it's got a signature of int and int, and it produces an int, then the result of add one plus two is three. So, um, you know, we can go on and do, speaking of type inference, uh, add xy equals x plus y. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Why would you do that? So see, we'll, we'll do this right on the fly and people can debug for me. Wow. Third time is charm. So that is where the uh, type decorators would come in and would want to specify uh, that we're taking in something other than an int because type inference gets you only so far. Um, if we look over here at this solution, we see that I've got three files and something else that is going to throw you off if you're used to OO, if you're used to C sharp. Um, let me go ahead and rebuild my solution here. We've got this basics <coughs> file uh, module, which used to be at the top, and I just broke the entire world because my employee module depends on basics. And would depend on basics if we had. It did happen last time. 
It hasn't happened since, but it happened again. Reseed it. Hit it until it works again. Right? I think we have something. Can we still see it on the? Still okay. Oh, all right. So by reordering my files, I took a working solution and I broke it because the order of declaration is important. Um, in object-oriented, you can sort of declare your classes, declare your things, uh, objects wherever you like as long as you reference them properly. Not so much in functional. Um, Nothing that I declared in the basics module exists. Uh, it really doesn't exist. It took out the whole screen when I moved that. And so the other two files that are below it are referencing things that don't exist yet and it can't find. Um, much like we can't find the video stream. So what, what you need to know about that is uh, there's a little bit more thought that goes into, okay, I'm declaring this record type I'm going to have to use it vertically below the rest of my code. All right. And we're back. So we can look and see uh, modules and namespaces are declared kind of similar to the way you'd expect uh, in C Sharp. Got module basics. And then uh, instead of the C Sharp declaration, we use open. And we can call out to all the uh, libraries and whatever DLLs or NuGet packages we've, we've referred to. Um, interestingly, the employee file is also a module, and we can sort of name things whatever we want uh, while we're talking about naming conventions. So this is employee types, an example of multiple files in F-sharp. Dash, dash, this is a horrible name. Let me move basics back up to uh, fix my project, and all of these errors magically go away. If we look at program, which is in the main module, the entire world goes dark again. Uh, did, we, did we lose the video feed? Nope, no we didn't, we're good. Um, so I open the basics module, I open all of these other packages, and I also open employee types, an example of multiple files in F sharp. This is a horrible name. I can blue screen of death. Um, and I can do this with my variables. It's not a good idea. It confuses people and it hurts my head. Uh, one of the characters I found that will break this, invalid namespace module or union type case name because I put a dot. Um, it, it hates the dots so much. I think I have so many dots in my code, that's what's killing the video feed. Um, you have a lot of flexibility. Again, sort of like with the um, variables are immutable, but they could be mutable. You should name these things intelligently and not commit horrific crimes against naming conventions. But if you choose to have extremely verbose names for whatever reason, you can do that. Um, so, by including, there we go. By including um, basics and the extremely long employee types name in my project, there we go. Um, we can now make use of some of these things that we've declared in these modules. Uh, we talked about type providers a little bit earlier, and we might again someday. Um, to show how terse and how quickly you can get up and running with uh, some of the out-of-the-box type providers, is it, is it on the video as well? Is that the problem? Yep, we're back again. I'll just raise my hand when it goes out. Um, here's, here's my type provider declaration. Um, we include 
the F Sharp data, F Sharp Data SQL client. Uh, SQL programmability provider is my provider of choice usually. There are others, there's SQL client, there's command provider, there's a flickering screen, it's lovely. Uh, if you remember that one line, basically I have a connection string and that points me to my AdventureWorks database and that has now instantiated a compile time uh, connection to that database and gives me my IntelliSense and lets me discover objects in my database. Um, in order to use it, I've got this let function down here that we'll see momentarily, uh, where I've basically got, basically got a use command which is similar to using in C Sharp, so we can dispose of that when it's done. Uh, created a stored procedure, get employees at or above level. Uh, because AdventureWorks, as we all know, has this lovely employee org chart and a hierarchy. I can say, uh, yep. My mistake was going into SQL. Let's not do that again. Uh, we, we can get SQL results and see that we can get the CEO and the people directly below the CEO out of this stored procedure. Video again? Okay. That's what? Uh, hold, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it is true that its roots were uh, very math and science heavy, uh, and a lot of um, somebody was talking to me yesterday about we had some case where we had to interface with MATLAB and very industry specific number crunching, uh, heavy lifting there. At the time that they did that, there was no MATLAB type provider, there is now. Um, but the equations and the logic mapped basically one to one between what people were doing in MATLAB, people much more intelligent than I am, and you almost kind of copy and paste that into F sharp. Uh, another good example, have you ever heard of Jet? Uh, they're an online retailer. They want to be an Amazon competitor. I've, I've used them. Uh, Christmas was sponsored by Jet in my household this last year. Um, they are very microservices driven. I think at last count, and there's somebody working there who's an F Sharp MVP, um, Rachel Reese, does a great talk on uh, microservices in, at Jet in functional languages. She said at last count there were like 395 of them. Uh, and functional, the pu functional paradigm sort of lends itself to microservices because it's very single responsibility. It's very one thing in, one thing out. Um, and they, I believe they have said that they use a lot of node for their website and their front end. But all the heavy lifting, all the logic, all the number crunching, everything that they do to try to get the prices down and real time, this and that. Jet runs on F sharp. They, they doubled down on that, so. That's a very good use case. Um, and really, um, there's, there's a, um, one of the resources I'm gonna bring up is this uh, F sharp cones, or Cohen's, I've heard it both ways project. Um, Flipped over to that just really quickly to kind of continue answering that question. Here's a bunch of stock data. Uh, this Cones project, this is one of the last things that you do. It is a series of tests that fail. And you have all these different uh, files that teach you about these different concepts. And you go through and you spend a couple hours and you work on getting all of these tests to pass. Um, if you like chaining your method calls together, and if you want to be able to select uh, the date that has the highest stock price out of this list um, in, in one line of code and this kind of flow speaks to you, just about anything is a good use case for F sharp. Um, so, now, so uh, do I wanna bring up Okay, new video box. I think we like SQL again. I'm gonna get really risky. <laughs> really? Okay, you just did that to mess with me. 
Um, yeah. What in the world? So, yeah, we won't be brave again. But for a hot second, we saw. I tried that. Oh, okay. So for a hot second, we saw these results. Another hot second. Another hot second. They're very exciting results. We see this list of employees out of this um, out of this stored procedure, and we basically can see that same thing now that we switch back to code. Yep. Um, with this one line of code up here uh, giving us a connection string which we can offload to, a, to an app config, we can see uh, we have um, all of these stored procedures in my AdventureWorks database. So there's a particular syntax for calling that with my parameter, which if we mouse over we can see is an int. Uh, we can also mouse over this operator, this, this function, uh, which Basically, all that pipe and, and uh, left arrow, or right arrow, excuse me, apply a function of the value to a value, with the value being on the left and the function being on the right. Um, in some work that I've done, I have chained about a half dozen of these together. And so, um, you have sequences, you have lists, you have a variety of ways to work with collections. Uh, sequences are lazy evaluated, lists are generally better if you have a set number of objects, small number of objects, et cetera. And this will give me, not gonna look back at the SQL, but we had about seven or eight results in the AdventureWorks database for those employees. Uh, this will give me a list from executing this stored procedure. And that's all I need to do for my type provider. Uh, yes? Uh, they are strongly typed, and I'm, I'm glad you asked, because you see down here, uh, employee names only. I want to get just the names, not all of the different columns, which we'd see if I were brave enough to put the SQL. Uh, we're getting an ID, we're getting um, name, position, p place in the hierarchy. Uh, you'll notice that I've got a type annotation on this function, and it's actually, I've got parens around it, because otherwise, the function believes that I'm annotating the result and dictating the type I'm expecting out, not the type that's coming in. So it's, it's a little wordy, and one of the most verbose parts of writing F-sharp that I've encountered so far. Uh, my collection of records is from the SQL programmability provider with this connection string, in DBO namespace, get employees at or above level. I'm getting a record out of that, and this is a list of those records. Um, take those records. We've got uh, very powerful mapping functions I can derive uh, or enter a function kind of on the fly and say for each element uh, in this collection, I really just want every object to be first name and last name. So that it gives you a type. You can't take this type and ship it over to SQL, uh, SQL Server. Can't ship it over to C Sharp. In order to interoperate with um, C Sharp, uh, any other .NET language, this is going to have to get cast down to uh, something like this, and a record type or discriminated union or something that plays a little bit nicer with, with the rest of the language. Um, so what we can do with that is uh, we can also kind of use matching and head tail recursion, uh, which is more efficient in a functional language because F sharp sees that the last thing you're doing is this tail call. Uh, we have an empty list, which we'll get to in a moment. We're sort of attacking it in conceptually reverse order. The last thing you see, we want to ignore that. It's empty, we don't have anything to operate on. Then we have this idea of uh, the head tail recursion do these actions for the head, and then call this function with the tail. And in every list, your head is the first item, and the tail is absolutely everything else. So if we start with a list of five things, we go this, through this a few times, then your head becomes item, tail is an empty list, and then your head is just empty list. 
Um, the other way that you could do this without recursion is a loop, very object oriented, very mutable, uh, big flag that maybe I'm not doing something idiomatically correct, um, but you can. And this will effectively do the same sort of thing and iterate through your list. Um, I apologize for killing the display. I'm going to change, what in the world? I'm going to change something about my stored procedure. Uh, instead of the ID, I'm gonna rename that field. It does not like SQL. And now I'm gonna go back to my project and I'm going to recompile. And I just broke my world again. Sorry. I, it doesn't like white. I need to change my uh, SQL Server Management Studio theme. Um, we've got this IntelliSense, we've got this record object that comes from the type provider and business entity ID is no longer a thing. I now have corporate ID. So I'll just do a wholesale find and replace because I'm not gonna change the stored procedure again. Um, and so what that buys me is, I know that that's gonna break before I deploy it. Uh, at the moment that this changes, I did not have to go in my project. Uh, is, anybody, is anybody familiar with Entity Framework or another ORM, basically? Uh, with Entity Framework, I'd have to go re-interrogate my database, rebuild my code level objects to talk to SQL and figure out, oh, well that's not uh, business entity ID anymore. I knew the second after I broke the world that it was broken. Could not build it, could not compile it, uh, couldn't deploy it. And when we take this and run uh, this employee list that I got through the type providers, uh, through my loop, and I want my list of employee records, through recursion, I want my list of names only, um, we get, Oops, it likes the black background, so we're basically looking at the SQL records anyway. Um, we get all of these employees that came from this, um, these, uh, this database call, and So in recursion, I'm doing a little bit of additional matching here, and I think that uh, the SQL rec results are now coming back with things that don't match these criteria, uh, which this is just an interesting way to kind of show the on steroids part of the uh, switch statement on steroids. While I'm doing my head tail recursion, I'm also matching on these different conditions uh, I don't want anything that contains chief in the job title. I want the corporate ID to be greater than this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is kind of a look at type providers in action, a little bit of matching, a little bit of recursion. Some of the things that make F sharp, um, I think much friendlier and more powerful with less overhead investment um, than the equivalent C-sharp. I have done a lot of uh, data processing, a lot of file moving around, a lot of, I guess, yak shaving, uh, those little tasks that to build a C-sharp solution would be very quick, but it would take maybe 100 lines of code. Usually, I'm getting about a third of the number of lines of F-sharp. Um, just because you can do so much with so little. Um, so, moving on, 
uh, seeing kind of where F sharp fits into the world, who's using it, is it just one of these little niche things that nobody's programming in? Uh, you've heard of Bayer Drock or Kaggle or Jet. Uh, Microsoft, if anyone plays Halo or is aware of the Xbox world, uh, somebody at Microsoft did a really interesting conversation about how they built the leaderboards in Halo uh, using F sharp. And that goes back again to what Paul was asking about a good use case, kind of very math intensive, a lot of variables. Uh, and at the F-Sharp Foundation website, there are a number of testimonials from other kinds of organizations, other people uh, giving specific advantages and, and use cases of this is what we're doing with F-Sharp. Uh, there are a lot of open source projects out there, a lot of uh, neat things that people are doing. And we've got build automation, unit testing, uh, there's a web server, um, and you can write JavaScript using FunScript. Uh, you can write F sharp and get JavaScript out of that. So if you want to uh, use F sharp kind of full stack, you could combine your F sharp web server with F sharp on the back end and your JavaScript that was generated from the F sharp that you wrote. Um, if you want to get started and play a little bit, learn a little bit more about F-Sharp, there are a number of resources out there. Uh, each of these things, uh, F-Sharp.org for fun and profit, try F-Sharp. Try F-Sharp, you can actually uh, write code in your browser and it'll compile and run just like some of the uh, tools online for other languages. Uh, use hashtag F-Sharp on Twitter. A lot of people will see that, a lot of people will comment on that. The community is great. Um, Reason to love the community number 317, about uh, last August, I just tweeted something about, hey, I just pushed a, a uh, project in a new language live, and I'm just you know, feeling a little nervous. Did I do it properly everywhere across the board? And the creator of the language was kind of hanging out on Twitter and said, hey, you know, comment and let us know how it went. Hope it goes really well. Um, went home, I said, honey, honey, jo Don Syme commented on my tweet. My wife's an artist, love her to death. She looked at me and said, what? She likes Dr. Who. I said, okay, so you know David Tennant? She said, yeah. Okay, so David Tennant commented on my tweet. I was like, wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, I tweeted that I was going to come here and talk about F Sharp. Uh, creator of the language liked it. Uh, what we've learned from that is creator language spends a lot of time sitting on Twitter. <laughs> but what he will also do, and what a number of other people, uh, kind of big names in the F-sharp functional world, people who've written books on the topic, uh, they apparently also spend a lot of time on Twitter. And so if you have a question, if you say, I'm having a problem with this, I don't know the F-sharpiest way to accomplish this, uh, tag it with the F-sharp hashtag. In five minutes, you will get people much, much smarter than me uh, commenting on, oh, well, when I wrote this feature, I envisioned it to being used this way. Um, so any questions that we didn't cover? Yes. How long do you recommend? Okay. Uh, I'll attack, do you feel proficient first? The question was, how long did it take you from day one, I'm just now seeing F sharp, to feeling proficient and feeling confident with the language? Um, I feel somewhat proficient. Uh, I, I, I would say comfortable newbie. Uh, and I've been working in it, I think, for about a year on and off. My day job is primarily C sharp, uh, primarily writing SQL reports and sitting in meetings this month. Um, from day one to producing something useful to something that I deployed, um, I would say two weeks, maybe. Uh, I've heard people compare it to chess, sort of minutes to learn, a lifetime to master. Uh, it's a very, very deep language. I didn't touch on computation expressions because when I thought that I was going to talk about F sharp, I said, what would I have wanted someone to explain to me when I was getting started? What concepts would I want to fly over? Computation expressions made my head explode uh, the first several times I encountered them. So that's a deeper well than I wanted to drink from today. Uh, there are a number of things that uh, asynchronous programming, eh, flown over it, 
much, much easier than when I do it in C, uh, C Sharp. Would I consider myself proficient enough that I'd want to come up here and talk about asynchronous programming in F Sharp? No. Um, so I, I'd say a month before I felt like, oh yeah, I'd rather do that in F Sharp than C Sharp. And everything that I have deployed to production in F Sharp, when I've gone back uh, and added to it or refactored it, it has not been a bug fix. It has been, I didn't understand the business requirements or the business requirements changed. Um, I can't say that about any of the C Sharp I've written lately. Other questions, thoughts, comments on biscuits? All right. Thank you very much. It's going to be great. Um, he literally wrote the book on enterprise web development uh, by O'Reilly. So, um, yeah, uh, come out for that. Should be a great talk. Look forward to seeing you next week. Going to have some more chicken and biscuits and macaroni and all that good stuff. <laughs>